Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Wallmeyer, and I am the local history librarian here at Johnson County Library. Thank you so much for attending today's program, The Past is Prologue, the Shawnee Tribe. The Past is Prologue is a bi-monthly program offered by Johnson County Library, where we highlight topics that are often left out, glossed over, or misrepresented in our history books. We would also like to begin today with a brief land acknowledgement. Our Kansas City area institutions stand on the homelands of Native American peoples at the juncture of the Missouri and Kansas rivers. In recent years, these nations have included the Delaware, Kansas, Missouri, Oto, Osage, and the Shawnee, who we are virtually hosting tonight. We pay respect to all indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, for their continuing presence in this land and the land where you may be joining us tonight. Now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Lee. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you for allowing us to come and present this tonight. We've had a lot of requests over the last couple of years for information on the Shawnee tribe. I, I know our cultural center it gets calls all the time asking for um, some information and uh, our, I'm, I'm with the uh, Shawnee Tribe Historical Preservation Committee, which is a volunteer organization made up of several tribal members that are trying to help preserve the, our history and some of the sites that we have out in the United States and in Kansas for sure. And uh, just trying to preserve our, our history and our culture. And uh, I've been working on it. Uh, it's been formed about a, about a year. And of course, it was uh, formed right before COVID. So everything remotely. But um, so this is kind of my first uh, webcast for this group. And um, I'm, you asked if we could tell some information about Kansas City, about the Shoney in Kansas City. So um, I'm, I'm going to do that, but in order to uh, really tell the story, you have to talk about uh, the Shawnee, where they came from, and, and what brought them to Kansas City. So I'm going to talk about that, uh, but a little bit about myself. I, I've been in uh, oil and gas business for almost 40 years and traveled all over the United States and lived in Texas for 20, 25 years and have only recently been back in Oklahoma. And since I came back here, I started working with the tribe and, and trying to help in any way I can, uh, the uh, business committee and the, the chief to uh, any anything I can uh, add to the tribe, kind of give back to the tribe. So, so that's why I'm kind of doing this. I really uh, am passionate about about our tribe, about our tribal history, and am actually working on several uh, fronts right now with our uh, committee uh, trying to present information to uh, the state of Ohio and uh, several historical societies in Kansas City. So uh, this is basically my first one and, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm gonna turn my camera off so that uh, I can move my screen a little bit so you don't have to watch me. You can uh, look at the slides and enjoy them, I hope. So as an introduction, uh, what does the Shawnee tribe have to do with Johnson County history? And as Amanda said, Kansas was uh, home to a number of tribes in the mid 1800s. And so uh, we're going to talk about Shawn the Shawnee there. Who were they or who are they? And I say were and are because uh, they were different. What they, what they were and what they are now are a little different in, in my mind. Where'd they come from? what they do in Kansas City, and where'd they go? So if you, if you live in Johnson County or in the surrounding area, you might have seen some of these names. These are Johnson County names that are essentially related to the Shawnee. Pascal Fish is a, was a prominent uh, leader, the town of Lenexa, Silver Hill Street. Silver Hill is my ancestor. Uh, we were, my wife and I were there at, uh, a few years ago looking around and we went to a Walmart and it's on Silver Hill Street. We were just dumbfounded. So it was a really kind of a thrill. Uh, and then Graham Rogers, Black Hoof, Black Bob, th there's a picture of the Shawnee Indian Mission, Indian Creek, 
Uh, Blue Jacket is a street in, um, in Shawnee Mission, I believe, at Joseph Parks. So those are names that you might see on a regular basis that you don't know who they are or what they are, and we're going to talk about a few of them. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of of the tribe and, and of the history, and and then we're going to talk about uh, Kansas, Kansas City primarily, uh, towards the end. Uh, but the the tribe, the Shawnee tribe, lived in uh, Johnson, Wyandotte, Douglas County, Miami, Franklin County, uh, all before it became a territory. And before that, the Shawnee were in the east, kind of on the east coast, and then Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and they were, that was their home. And they fought for about 150 years trying to keep their lands there. And every time they had war or, or a skirmish or something like that, they would get pushed west. And it went from one place to another and another. And they were treaties. They had to cede land and things like that. And um, they just continued to get pushed west. And then after a, a long time, the the tribe kind of splintered into several different groups and they all had different viewpoints of the future at that time. Some of them wanted to assimilate. They were, they were tired of fighting. There weren't very many left. There were others that said, okay, we're just leaving. We're going to, we're going to get away from uh, the, the white encroachment and leave. And they went to Missouri and then others uh, continued to try and fight. And we'll talk about that. And then after the Shawnee were in, in Kansas, the, the white settlers kept coming west, coming west. And so everybody knows bleeding Kansas was a, a real nightmare for everyone that lived in that area. And it was especially hard on the tribal members that were there. And so eventually they decided to move on down to Oklahoma. So who are the Shawnee? Well, the name Shawnee is, a, is an Algonquin name, comes from the Algonquin name Shawano, and it translates as Southerner. And that's because some of the tribes recognized that they lived in the south part of the country and south of a lot of the Algonquin tribes were up in the north uh, towards Canada and places like that in the eastern eastern part of the country. And so the Shawnee were, were in the south and they, they called them uh, Shawano. But they're Algonquin-speaking uh, Eastern Woodland Tribe, and they they originated in the greater middle Ohio Valley, and they had ties to the Fort Ancient Culture, which is a series of um, mound, uh, kind of a mound-building uh, society that are still there. Uh, I, I've not seen them, but they're supposed to be really uh, quite uh, quite interesting. And so that was about 1,000 to uh, 1,700 A.D., and they're still there, and there's quite a few similarities in the Shawnee with uh, what they found at Fort Ancient. The historic homeland of the Shawnee was uh, basically Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia. They lived in Pennsylvania for a while, and actually in other parts of the country. Uh, they were known as the greatest travelers. If you read information about the tribe, you'll see that mentioned a lot of times. They, they just moved a lot, and it was uh, lots of different reasons. Some of it was they had pressure from other tribes. At one point, the Iroquois were pushing them out of Ohio because they wanted their, their, uh, their game that was there, and so they shoved them out of there, and, and then they got down – uh, further south, and so the whites started coming in, and they shoved them back north, and uh, so they they relocated their villages uh, a, a lot. And if you look at some of the old maps, you'll see the name Chillicothe, which was their main town, on a whole bunch of different locations in the east. So if you look at this <clears throat> this map, you can see these are areas where they lived, and this. This red and yellow is a concentration. So the brighter that concentration or heavier that is, the more people were there at any given time. And so this is Ohio, and then this is uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. And they were 
they were down here in the South as well, <clears throat> all the way down to Florida, the Carolinas, Florida, Alabama. And then later they moved West to Illinois, Missouri, and then this, this is Oklahoma, but here's Kansas City. So you could see they were uh, pretty uh, nomadic at times, not, not all the time, but just at times. <clears throat> this is a kind of a picture, a map of where they moved and at different times of, uh, of their uh, ex existence from 79 to 1869. And eventually what this is showing is that one, one band, the Eastern Shawnee moved to directly to Oklahoma from Ohio. Uh, my family moved, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think some of them moved from Ohio directly to Kansas City. Although we have some statements that say some of my family may have moved from Ohio to Missouri on the Mississippi, then to Kansas and so on and so forth. And then there was a, another band that was in uh, Southern Missouri. They went up, they, uh, they went to uh, Southern Missouri, pardon me, and then went up there and that was a Black Bob band. So you could see that at different times they migrated in, in different places. And uh, it's really kind of a, kind of hard to piece together everybody. It's, a, it's kind of a struggle. So just kind of an overview of the history of, of the tribe, but over, over the years that uh, we're talking about prior to their moving to Kansas. So pre-contact, before the Europeans showed up, up to 1600, again, they were strong, had strong ties to the Fort ancient culture, which is in the middle of Ohio Valley. And the Shawnee at that point, and, and since then, we're very closely associated with another Algonquin-speaking tribe, the Delaware. And then from early contact times, from 1600 to 1700, there was a spread of European diseases. This is when the Iroquois, who were trading with uh, the French, British, had, they, they were all trading together, and they were trying to get guns and ammunition and they would get pots and pans. We would give them furs and pelts and things like that. And, and they would, the Europeans would give us things that, that they valued. So it was it actually was working out pretty well off and on. And, but the problem was there was a lot of pressure on game because all the tribes were trading with Europeans and they were over, um, uh, What's the word I want? Oh, uh, they were they were killing too many, too many um, beaver and and buck uh, deer and things like that. And so they were the pressure was just too great. So they would they would move and they would uh, the Iroquois uh, push the Shawnee down down south and so they were down there for a while. And so it was just kind of a kind of a mess. And then and then later the the Europeans started coming in in higher higher numbers. Instead of just traders, they were actually settlers. And so they, they started coming into the East Coast, right? And there was Jamestown and, and all that area along there where they started settling. And there were some skirmishes with the uh, uh, Powhatans and other, other tribes where they just about wiped out uh, everybody in Virginia, in Western Pennsylvania. And then so the about that time the Europeans started coming over the, the Appalachian Mountains and were encroaching even more so on the Shawnee. And the Shawnee had moved back up to Ohio by then and Western Pennsylvania. And so they about 1750, they had moved further west, and there were other Shawnee joining them in the Ohio, Ohio River Valley. And they were trying to distance themselves from the whites at that point, and they were trying to live in peace. Well, then you have, that didn't work out. So the, the whites were trying to move further west. The Indians were trying to keep them from coming into their, uh, their land. And so a lot of fights broke out. And there were just, it's almost incessant wars. It's from, if you just look at the decades and there's wars after wars after wars. And 
a lot of them. So I, I'm going to go through a few of them that are of, of interest, I think, that were kind of the things that I thought you might be interested in. And so, but it was just constant. And there were times when they were, they were fighting and then they would, uh, they would have peace and then they would start fighting again and then they'd have peace. And it seems like every time they would fight, the Shawnee would lose and they would uh, have to give up some land, Kentucky or uh, Ohio or whatever. And, and you'll see over, over this presentation that it just was constant. And then the, the final war was uh, the War of 1812. So the British were still trying to knock the Americans out at that point. And so they got the Shawnee to help them. And so they had, uh, and the other allied uh, tribes, and they were trying to uh, kick them out one last time. We we're going to push them out of Ohio. And that was their thought process. And a young Shawnee named uh, Tecumthah, uh, had organized a multi-tribe confederacy. He had gone to a bunch of the tribes and said, this is our last, last chance to get the Long Knives out of Ohio and in, out of our country. And he had some success in building a confederacy. He was a, quite an order, and, but he didn't get them all. And it, it just didn't work out for him. So after that, that last war, uh, there was a migration to Missouri, or there were some after the uh, uh, Northwest Indian War. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the, uh, some of the Shawnee moved to Missouri along the Mississippi. And then those are the Shawnee. They had a Spanish land grant there, and they ended up moving to Kansas as well. They were the first ones actually to move to Kansas. And so they, 1830 and 1825, the Shawnee moved to Kansas from Missouri, and they were um, given a 1.2 million acre reservation in what would become Northeast Kansas, essentially Johnson, Wyandotte County, and, and that. And then uh, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 basically pushed the rest of the Shawnee that were still in Ohio to the same lands in Kansas. So kind of backing up just a little bit and, and going over some of the particulars of these wars. So when the uh, immigrants started pouring into the new world, they had uh, a big appetite for land. And I don't understand the reasoning behind it. You know, we live in a world where we live in a postage stamp yard in a lot of places. And we think that's great. And I know my family, uh, my Lee side of my family came to the United States in early 1600s and th they're going to be part of this as well. So, so they, they moved a lot. And, and if you look at their side, they moved from Virginia to Kentucky or to Tennessee, Kentucky, so on and so forth to Texas, Oklahoma and they just kept moving. It was just really strange if you look at the way the people from Europe came over and started moving around. And, and so they, as they did that, they, they were pushing the native tribes out of the way. And, and by doing that, they had, they had a lot of fighting going on. And in, in this time period, Britain claimed most of the Eastern seaboard. This is before the Revolutionary War. And then France had a lot of the Canada and Mississippi area and, and west of the Appalachians. And so they were fighting each other for land claims. There were a lot of the tribes up in the Northeast, the Iroquois, Huron, Mohawk, Oneida, Cayuga, Delaware, Seneca, all those that the French and the British traded with. Everything was great, you know, off and on. But then the tribes started fighting each other over hunting grounds because the game was depleted. And so that caused friction. It caused a lot of problems. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, France and, and Britain used that infighting between tribes to gain a foothold in the area. And they actually got the Iroquois to cede land to Britain that was essentially 
the Shawnees land and the, the Iroquois said, oh, it's our land. And they, they wrote them a, a treaty and it wasn't even their land. It was the Shawnee's land. Shawnee weren't real happy about it. So here's kind of a map of the tribes in that area about 1700. The Ojibwe were up in Canada and then the, you can see where the Shawnee, Miami, Illinois, Delaware, Powhatan, all those were uh, just full of uh, native tribes. And that, that was their home. So if you look at this map, this is a 1740 and the brown is where Britain had settled along uh, the eastern side of the Appalachian Mountains. This is, of course, the 13 colonies, essentially. And, and then all this on the green is basically was French territory. They claimed that. And so uh, Britain and, and the settlers that came in that were English, uh, they wanted to move west of the mountains. And so they were encroaching seriously on the Shawnee and these other tribes and then causing a lot of wars, a lot of, a lot of killings on, on both sides. So at this point, the population was about 900,000. I found a chart that estimated the population at different times. And so you think of 1740, you think that's, you didn't realize that there was almost a million people already on the East Coast. That's a, a big number. So one of the biggest wars was the French and Indian War. And France fought against England and they, they were able to get a lot of the tribes to fight with them. And so France was saying, we're gonna, we're gonna be your buddies and we're gonna provide you all this stuff. Whereas the, the British were trying to take their land. And so it was kind of an easy, easy concept for the Shawnee to understand, okay, well, these, these people are trying to take our stuff and these are trying to help us. So we'll fight, we'll fight them. And so if you look at this green area, that's kind of what they call disputed territory. So France said they had it, Britain said they had it. And actually the people that had it were the tribes. And so they were getting squeezed kind of from both sides. So the uh, French and Indian War is a pretty big deal. So these are uh, some some paintings by some uh, really nice artists that, that do a lot of art on French and Indian War and, and other things like that. This is kind of the way people look back then, near as we can tell. Uh, so due to the, the struggle over these disputed lands, uh, the war fought between France and England was aided by a, a number of Native American allies. And oddly enough, over the years, uh, the tribal allegiance to England or France switched between wars as tribes allied with whoever they thought would provide them weapons and goods and thought that they would be their best opportunity for the future. And, it, and they would just kind of switch. They even switched in the middle of the war at one point. So this French and Indian War was particularly ugly on the frontier side. So during the war, there were a lot of raids on homesteads. There were forts. They, they built a lot of forts where they were, uh, they would house a number of families. They, it's kind of like the, the old show Daniel Boone where people had homesteads outside the fort. And if there was an Indian sack, they would go into the fort. And usually they were successful in, in warding off the attacks. So this was going on in West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and there were a lot of settlers killed. And if you, if you think about it, the, the Shawnee are trying to maintain their homeland. They're just, it's like you have somebody coming and sitting on your front yard saying, okay, this is mine now. And they build a tent or whatever. And you're going to, you're going to say, no, I don't think so. And you're probably going to do something about it, but uh, maybe not tomahawk them. But, but at that time that was, uh, that was what there were lots, just again, lots of killing. So in this time frame, there's 1.1 and a quarter million 
population. This is the white population. So in, in 1758, the Shawnee and Delaware attacked a place called Fort Upper Tract. And then they went to Fort Seward in Virginia. And at Fort Upper Tract, all 22 of the inhabitants at the fort were, were killed, including my five times great grandfather, John Hutchison. He was a Scotsman who had moved to America earlier, and he somehow he got land in West, what is now West Virginia, and he was patented land, and he hadn't been at the wrong place at the wrong time. So he was at Fort Upper Track and was, was killed with the other 20, 21 people. His daughter was already born, of course, and she married a neighbor who they moved Shortly after this happened, they decided to move somewhere else because it wasn't safe there. So they moved somewhere else. And so my fourth great grandmother married uh, one of my Lee. She was a, a part of my Lee's side of my family. But the, after they attacked Fort Upper Track, they went to Fort Siebert and captured or killed soldiers there. So... After the French and Indian War, the French were beaten and, and the allies, they kind of left, the native allies left. And so they, they had the Treaty of Paris that was signed by France and England. And the Americans, uh, the Native Americans had nothing to do with it. They were not part of that treaty. They weren't even uh, talked about. And so what happened was they, uh, Britain ended up, put, ended up pushing France further west and taking, as you can see here, all this land up to what looks like the uh, Mississippi River. So now where this was disputed territory, now it, it was owned by Great Britain and France decided they were done for now. So one thing that, that was kind of good was Britain had done this Royal Proclamation of 1763. And this was after the um, French and Indian War. There were still problems with uh, colonists trying to, to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. There were already people there. They were in Kentucky, Virginia, and, and those areas. And Britain said that they wanted all those settlers to stay out of there, do not cross the Appalachian Mountains, and if you are over there, to go back on the other side, on the east side. And that was the proclamation. It was, if I recall, they, they had to have a pass. The only people who were allowed over there were traders. And uh, the Native Americans and the colonists could not buy land from each other. The Native Americans couldn't sell it, and the... Uh, Colonials could not buy land west of the Appalachian Mountains. So they really did try, however lame it was, and, and maybe they didn't do a good job at um, policing it, but they, they did make some effort to keep the colonists, at least at that time, east of the Appalachian Mountains. So here's some of the Shawnee leaders of that time period. These are names that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. Uh, they all played a major role in, in the Shawnees' fight for their, their homeland. So Cornstalk, the first one, was peace chief, but when peace wasn't in vogue, he, he did a lot of, uh, led a lot of battles, a lot of raids, and he was pretty vicious. Uh, again, they were trying to, to keep their homeland. He was also uh, led the Battle of Point Pleasant, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then was murdered at Fort Randolph in 1777. And there are Cornstalk relatives leading the tribe today. He, he is my fifth great uncle. So my fourth great grandfather was his name was Silverheel, and that was his brother. And Cornstalk is a, a well, very well known Shawnee leader. And probably the next one, Blue Jacket, is probably even a better uh, known Shawnee leader. He was a war chief, and he fought against the colonists in the American Revolution and in the Northwest Indian Wars. 
and was unfortunately beaten at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. And there are a lot of Blue Jackets in our tribe today, and they're leading. A lot of leaders have been in our tribe. And Black Hoof, or Kata Hikasa, who there's a park named after him in Lenexa, he was a, an, also a civil chief, uh, but he also led a lot of battles. And he was at the uh, Battle of Fallen Timbers as well. Black Hoof, Black Hoof signed the Treaty of Greenville, which ceded Ohio lands for Kansas lands. He helped organize the resettlement in Kansas before he died. He never went to Kansas. He helped uh, put that together with the uh, U.S. government. And, and when he died, he was like 100, over 100 years old when he died. And uh, you know that's not a mistake. He really was. But he was very, uh, very prominent in this portion of the tribe. He was part of my the tribe that I belong to. So the, the three Shawnee, there are three distinct Shawnee tribes now, and he was the prominent in the one that, that I belong to, all three of these. Uh, I also have some relationship to Blue Jacket, although I don't know how exactly. I, I do a lot of genealogy, have for 40 years, and I've got some DNA matches with some Blue Jacket descendants, and uh, we think it's way back, but... There were a lot of silver heels and blue jackets married later in life, later uh, after Kansas, at Kansas around there. But we don't know prior to that. Funny thing is they don't usually tell who the women are, the wives of these men. They just say Shawnee woman. And so that's kind of hard to track who, who they were. So... This is uh, Lord Dunmore's war. This is a battle point pleasant I was talking about that Cornstock led. So the colonists had refused to stay east of the Appalachian Mountains, of course, and they were in um, Kentucky and they would cross into Ohio. But uh, Kentucky was the Shawnee's hunting grounds. They didn't live there a lot, but they, they went down there and hunted and it was their land. That, that was their land. And so Daniel Boone and, and all those um Frontiersmen were down there and they built homes and forts and stuff. And so uh, the Shawnee, again, were trying to keep them out. As a matter of fact, I read one article said that they met Daniel Boone at the first time they met him. They didn't kill him. They told him, you know, go back across the mountains and don't come back. And he didn't listen to them. And so he came back and came back and put up settlements and things like that. And eventually at one point uh, there was a fight and, the Shawnee killed his son, Israel, and they captured his daughters and took him captive. And they also captured him and took him captive. And so there was a long history between Daniel Boone and the Shawnee. So anyway, there's a lot of raids going on, a lot of terrible things that happened to each side. Uh, the colonists would do bad things. They, they just wanted the heathens out of their area. I mean, they, they thought it was their land. They, they just did everything they could to get rid of them. And then the Shawnee were trying to keep them out as well. And so uh, there was a, Logan was a chief that had uh, some of the white colonists killed his family. They just uh, murdered his family and he wasn't there at the time. And so he kind of uh, got kind of upset and so he gathered a bunch of people and they started uh, raiding a lot of the homes and it, it turned pretty ugly. So things just got worse and worse. And in 1774, Cornstock led about a thousand, thousand Shawnee and Mingos and, and attacked the Virginia militia at Point Pleasant, West Virginia, what's now Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And Cornstock, according to the things you read, people that heard him yelling, be strong, be strong to his warriors. And there were people that had been raised by Shawnee that understood Shawnee. He wasn't speaking English. And they said uh, he was uh, very vocal and right in the middle of, of the fight. And so uh, the fight only lasted a day, but uh, it was the Shawnee uh, retreated across the Ohio River and went back to their villages. And that was the only battle of Lord Dunmore's war. And at that point, the chiefs 
decided to uh, sign a peace treaty, the Treaty of Camp Charlotte, and they ceded Kentucky to the colonies. So the Ohio River, which is between Kentucky and Ohio, became the new boundary for the uh, white settlers. They couldn't go north of that. Well, at this time, this is 1774, there's two and a half million white population in what's now almost the United States. Oh, and this uh, weapon over here was a weapon that was taken from the Shawnee fighters that were killed. Uh, after the battle, the uh, soldiers were asked to pick up all the weapons and items that were left with uh, on any Shawnee or that they had left. And they were taken and they were put together and they were auctioned off. And this particular weapon, which is actually a carpentry tool, was, they think, they must have been picked up after they raided a colonist's home, uh, was used, was carried by Shawnee Warrior in the Battle Point Pleasant, according to this documentation. And if you read any of the documents about that war, it always it always talks about this, that they picked up the weapons and... Um, so uh, I, I, own, I own that now. So Cornstock, as I said, was a, basically a peace chief. And so after the Battle of Point Pleasant and the Camp Charlotte Treaty, he was, uh, he was fine with keeping peace, and he didn't want any more problems. Well, at that point, uh, the Revolutionary War started in Britain, and the United States were or the Americans were going at it. And they were trying to get him, and in the Shawnee, uh, the British were trying to get them to fight the Americans or the, the colonists, which would become Americans. And Cornstalk said, no, we're not doing that. We've signed a peace treaty, and and we're not going to. But unfortunately, there were other, poor, other people in the tribe, younger warriors that wanted to fight. They, they believed the British could help them get rid of the Americans, push them back out of, out of Kentucky. And the British offered them all kinds of stuff, you know, and they, uh, so Cornstalk went to Fort Randolph, which had been built at the site of the Point Pleasant battle. And it was a fort that they built. And so the, um, he went there with uh, Delaware Chief Red Hawk to tell the commander at the fort that, we're trying to keep peace, but there are a bunch of young uh, warriors that want that don't want to bury the hatchet. They want to fight, and so the commander decided to keep Cornstalk and and Red Hawk as prisoners, just to make sure that nothing funny was going on. And so they kept him. He was there for quite some time, and they wouldn't let him leave. His son, uh, Ellen Ipsico went to see him to ask, you know, where's, you know, how come you haven't come home? And he was told that he was uh, a prisoner. And shortly after he was there, at the same time he was there, there was a, a couple of guys out hunting that were from the fort and somebody found them dead. And at the same time, and the other Members of the fort got mad thinking that uh, Cornstalk's son had killed those people. And nobody knows. I think they finally realized that maybe it was somebody else. But in their fit of rage, they came in and they uh, they attacked Cornstalk and Red Hawk and his son and killed them just point blank in where they were being held in a little cabin. Uh, they just rushed in there and they just shot them full of holes. And so uh, that was... Uh, an unfortunate term of events. So, so that was kind of the end of, of that time period. But uh, so there was some some peace, some fighting. It, it, it's a constant peace fighting, peace fighting. And so, uh, in 1780, uh, again, this is during the, the Revolutionary War. Britain is still trying to uh, trying to make trouble 
in the West, what was then considered the West. So the Revolutionary War was going on in the East and uh, they were trying to cause problems in the West. So this British Captain Henry Byrd led about a thousand Shawnee warriors and a few British soldiers into the uh, different areas. This again was, I believe, West Virginia, maybe Virginia. And they, um, Henry Byrd brought the first cannon into battle in that Western theater. And they used it at Ruddle Station and they blew holes in the door at Ruddle Station. So what used to be uh, a fort was fairly well protected. It was hard for the uh, anybody to get in there. Well, once they brought the cannon in, it just kind of blew the door open. And so Captain Isaac Ruddle surrendered right away. You know, it was hopeless. So uh, he surrendered and there were hundreds of prisoners taken. They, they took all the people and they uh, forced them to walk to Detroit where they were uh, released and, and out of the country, essentially. There were uh, some of the captives were taken to Shawnee towns and they were adopted in the tribe. The Shawnee did that a lot. They would take captives and they would replace uh, men or children that had died through the wars and they would take someone. Well, one of the captives was Stephen Ruddle. He's a very well-known white captive. He grew up with Tecumseh and he, he lived with Tecumseh for about 15 years and fought with him uh, in the Northwest Indian Wars. But after the Northwest Indian Wars, part of the, that treaty was that the Shawnee had to give up all their white captives. And so they were given people back that had been with them for years. And so if they were taken as a child, now this Indian mother was their real mother and they didn't want to go back. So it was a real, real mess as far as that goes. And after, after uh, Ruddle's station, they attacked Fort uh, Martin station and took more prisoners. Well, Stephen Ruddle is actually my second cousin. His mother was named Elizabeth Bowman. Isaac Ruddle was the captain. His wife was Elizabeth Bowman, who is also on my Lee side of my family. And so she was my fifth great grandfather's cousin. So she's my first cousin five times back. Stephen Ruddle is my second cousin five or six, four or five times back. So the the way these families, and especially mine, intertwine with both sides is just incredible. But since they, my family was there so early on, it was almost uh, inevitable, I guess, unless they stayed in one spot. So I've come up with some really doozies, but that was one I found not too long ago. It is quite, quite interesting. So, uh, it wasn't just the Shawnees who were attacking forts. So this uh, massacre of Delaware Christians, 1782, uh, Gnaden was a group of Pennsylvania militia who had gone to this, this area. This was a Moravian uh, missionaries had this uh, settlement and they were all Christian Lenape men and women and children. And, Essentially, what happened was the Pennsylvania militia thought they were attacking their settle their settlers, and so they went to uh, teach them a lesson, I guess. And so, what happened was they they captured them, which didn't take much because they weren't fighting; they were living there by themselves. They they weren't trying to do anything, but they elected to kill all of them, and so they put them inside a building. Uh, kind of lean to or whatever, and they just beat them to death. And then they mutilated their bodies. And so they killed 28 men, 29 women, 39 children. It was, it was a terrible day. The anniversary was not too long ago. Uh, two young boys that one was scalped and the other wasn't hurt uh, as bad, uh, played dead and they escaped and they were able to tell the story. And so at this site, there's a monument there in Ohio. So it was, it was ugly on both sides uh, of the fighting. So the Northwest Indian Wars, 1785 to 1795, was more of the same. This was after the Revolutionary War 
but Britain was still there. They were still causing problems and they wanted the, the Indians to uh, rise up again and try to push the Americans back West. Well, uh, so a lot of, uh, a lot of the Shawnee and uh, fought with them. Uh, George Washington, who wasn't president yet sent an army to the Northwest territory, which was Ohio and Illinois, that area. And, George Rogers Clark and Benjamin Logan were both generals in Kentucky militiamen and they raided Indian villages and they'd go in and they would destroy the villages. They would kill anybody there, including uh, children. And then they would burn the villages and they would destroy their food supply. And so they, the Shawnee had a lot of corn and, and things like that, that they needed for the winter. Logan and Clark would destroy that so that they nearly starved to death. So, but Logan was especially brutal, torturing, killing women and children. And that was known as Logan's raid. And at that time, the Shawnee was pretty well devastated. And from what I understand, they barely survived the winter with uh, little food. And then attacks on the settlers. So in, in retribution, they attacked settlers. And in this time frame, there was about 1500 settlers killed on, on the Ohio River. And war continued for a long time. And one of the battles that Chief Blue Jacket and Miami Chief's Little, Little Turtle fought was called St. Clair's Defeat. And it's still the worst defeat by a U.S. Army in the history of the Army. They lost 97% of their men to Blue Jacket and uh, Little Turtle. Washington finally was trying to make peace with the tribes. He sent Mad Anthony Wayne in there to treat with the engines. They, they'd fight for a while. They'd uh, talk for a while. And then, and anyway, uh, Blue Jacket led a force at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, and he was overwhelmed by Wayne's army. They were retreating to get help from the British. Uh, at, I think it was Fort Miami, and the British wouldn't open the gates and let them in. And so they were kind of done with the British for them. But uh, so if you look at the census, this is the yeah, first official census of the government. 1790 is uh, 3.9 million uh, white settlers. So this is kind of a depiction of the Battle of Fallen Timbers. After that battle, the Treaty of Greenville, 1795, opened uh, nearly all of Ohio to American settlements. Uh, there are a couple of uh, reservations that were left uh, for the Shawnee, but everything else was open for white settlement. A lot of the tribes had had enough, and they moved uh, west to get away from the onslaught. So War of 1812 ended up being the last war in this area, and it was um, about 10 years after the Northwest Indian Wars, again, uh, Tecumthah realized that in his mind, the Americans weren't going to stop it. Obviously, they weren't. They were moving into Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin. And so he had gathered this confederacy of different tribes. He, along with his brother, uh, Tenskatrawa, uh, he was called Shawnee Prophet. He actually ended up in Kansas. Uh, they were trying to get help. They ended up fighting with the British and uh, the British supplied them guns and ammunition. And so the, the war basically ended at the Battle of Thames when uh, Tecumthah uh, raised about 1,500 uh, warriors and they had a few British soldiers. They attacked several locations in the area. And, but in the end, uh, they were beaten pretty badly at the uh, Battle of Thames and uh, Tecumthah refused to retreat. He was killed in the battle. The Confederacy fell apart and some of the, some of the other leaders continued to fight a little bit, but to no avail. And uh, the Americans defeated the British and that was kind of the end of, of them. And so for 200 years, uh, the Shawnees fight for their homeland basically came to an end. So if you look at this, this was Ohio and Lake, here's Lake Erie, Ohio, all that country that the Shawnee called home in 1715 ended up 
as three little small reservations that were essentially back to postage stamps. If you talk about today's standards, um, every time there was a war and the Shawnee lost, they gave up more land and more land and more land until they got to this point. So this was about 1820. About that time and, and slightly before, that's kind of when the Shawnee split. Uh, some of them got tired of fighting. They moved to Missouri. The Spanish asked them to come to Missouri and fight the Osage, get rid of the Osage. And so uh, they did that. My group with uh, Blue Jacket and Black Hoof stayed in on those reservations, and they they didn't take up arms with uh, Tecumtha. Uh, they they felt like their best future was to ally with the Americans and and start becoming uh, assimilated, and that's what they did. Uh, Tecumtha did not. He he kept fighting, and then a lot of them were killed, and then the the other. Uh, tribe had left early earlier for Missouri, and so they'd had had enough. So now we're finally getting to Kansas. In uh, 28 to 54, they moved to Kansas. Uh, the Missouri Shawnee were, again, encroachment by, by whites into Missouri and that area, and so they, the government gave them uh, 1.2 million acres reservation in Kansas, and the Missouri moved to Kansas the Ohio tribe uh, finally moved as well, closer to around 1830. They had to sell all their uh, improvements. They had been farming and ranching and all that in Ohio, and they had to sell all their stuff to move to Kansas. And they, the, the government messed up. They were supposed to move them in the spring so they could grow crops when they got there. But there was miscommunication, typical uh, government issues and they didn't start till fall and by the time they got to kansas they were uh, there was no way to grow food or anything so they were kind of dev devastated and it was a really tough uh, tough for them uh, once they were in kansas uh, they they actually started building houses and and farming and ranching and and they were actually quite wealthy uh, over over the years they were there uh, a lot of them became uh, very successful. Uh, some of the firsthand accounts that you read uh, say it was difficult for to tell any difference between a Shawnee farm or the white settlers that were in the area. The Indian missions, there's, there were three of them in, in uh, Kansas City. The Quaker Mission, which was established in 34 by uh, Henry Harvey, he was with them in Ohio, and they liked the Quakers. Uh, they said that the Quakers were the only people, only white people that ever treated them fairly. And the Shawnee Methodist Mission was built in 29 by Reverend Thomas Johnson. The first one near Turner. The second one is in Fairway, and the buildings are still there. It's actually a museum, and that's probably the last item that the Shawnee have that's tangible that you can touch. It was our mission, and uh, we sent a lot of kids there to school, a lot of orphans as well, and uh, it's still there. And then there was a Shawnee Baptist mission, which was a uh, different, different part of town, a couple miles uh, from the Methodist mission. And uh, uh, Reverend, Reverend Isaac McCoy and Jotham Meeker were there, and they, they ran that mission. And, and Jotham Meeker printed the first newspaper in Kansas, it was Kansas territory. This was 1830s. And it was the very first uh, native newspaper, totally in a native language. And there's one copy exists. I didn't put it on here, but there's one copy exists. It's in the Missouri, University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, it's, it's quite cool. So this is a picture of what current Shawnee mission looks like. You can see there was a large large buildings, dormitories. Um, they taught them crafts, how to uh, do woodwork and things like that. That And the, the girls were taught how to sew and things like that. And so things that they could take in the future, and, but they were being assimilated by into the white culture. These are some of the chiefs, the prominent chiefs in Kansas. 
Reverend Charles Blue Jacket was a Methodist minister and an interpreter. He was a grandson of Blue Jacket, the one that was in the uh, wars before. And he became a, a good businessman. He moved to Oklahoma later and lived there. He had 23 children, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Graham Rogers uh, was a chief there in the 1860s. He was an instructor and carpenter at the mission. He helped build the mission in 1839. He built a home at Miriam and McKay that's still there. And he was a captain of the Shawnee militia who fought for the North during the Civil War. There were a number of Shawnee uh, war, uh, warriors that went and uh, fought uh, with the North. And then uh, Captain Joseph Parks uh, was a, also uh, an interpreter, and he was a, uh, labeled as a hero in the Seminole War. The, Semino the government was trying to force the Seminole to Oklahoma, and they wouldn't go, and so they hired a number of um, Shawnee, uh, Shawnee members and some other tribes to go fight the Seminole and try to beat them to, to go to uh, Oklahoma. And so he led that. My uh, great-great-grandfather was one of those, 1832. Uh, his name was Bill Ellick. He was on the, listed as one of the soldiers. Tenskwatawa is the Shawnee prophet. That was uh, Tecumthe's brother. He was uh, a holy man, and he was trying to uh, keep everybody, he's trying to keep everybody from liquor and trying to keep everybody living in this uh, cultural, the Shawnee culture ways. And when Te while Tecumthe was trying to build his confederacy, the prophet was working uh, other tribes as well. Um, he he kind of made some uh, statements that things would happen that, that didn't, and he kind of lost favor with the tribe after the war of 1812. And he moved to Kansas, he was one of the first groups with my uh, third great-grandfather, Silver Hill. Uh, they moved to about 1828, I believe, in the, with the fish ban. And so uh, also some prominent members in Shawnee are the, these Black Hoofs, Blue Jackets, Black Bob, Captains, Corn Answers, Peter Cornstock, Moses Silver Hill was my uncle, great uncle. This is my great grandmother. Her name's Julia Ellick, and she was born in '51 in Johnson County. She was orphaned after uh, birth. Her parents, I think, were probably killed or died about 1852 from cholera. There was a bad cholera epidemic that went through there, and it <clears throat> really uh, killed a lot of Shawnee. And I believe that's, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty certain that must have been what it was. She was raised by uncle, her uncle, Moses Silverheels, and was a, he was a prominent uh, figure in the tribe. And her allotment land, uh, which was given to her before they moved to Oklahoma, is actually the site of Tomahawk Park in Leewood. It's a kind of greenway, green belt, and a soccer field. That was her actual, uh, part of her actual land. So the Shawnee didn't live in teepees in Kansas. They lived in modern houses of the time. These are two houses that are still standing, both of them built in the 1830s. They were log houses, uh, but have been either added on or siding was put over them. The top one is John Silverheels, who was my great-grandmother's cousin. It's still there. It's on 47th Street. And the uh, bottom picture is Graham Rogers' home, which was uh, built again in the in the 1830s. Uh, it's at Mc Mer McKay, and I can't remember the other name of the street, but it's still there. So some other other names that you might hear: uh, Lenexa. Uh, her her Indian name was Nanexi, and the city of Lenexa uh, na is named after her. She was a uh, wife of uh, Kwasaki uh, Blackhoof, who was the son of Chief Blackhoof that we talked uh, Blackhoof we talked about a short, uh, short while ago. Uh, Kwasaki was a prominent uh, Shawnee leader in Kansas. He signed several treaties and documents for the tribe and was a uh, 
adamant about uh, not having any uh, liquor in the in the area. That was another problem with the, the tribes at times, and he was uh, dead set against that. So he he was a, a good man. I understand. Her husband died about 1857, and uh, Nenexi uh, was pronounced Lenexa by the whites, and she was a farmer who raised uh, crops, and she was apparently quite successful, and her farm was 60, around 69th and Neiman Road. And this is a statue of her at uh, the Lenexa uh, Community Center. I don't know if that's their... Uh, Civ uh, civic center or what, but uh, anyway, they're, they're quite proud of her. So it's a few other prominent settlers, and we're getting close to being done. Uh, the Shotos were uh, traders that came in. They were allowed to come in and trade with the Indians. Frederick and Cyprian Shoto were French traders. Their son, William Shoto, had Shoto Station. Uh, William Sh William Choteau's son married my great grandmother, the one I showed you earlier, uh, but he died uh, on his way to Oklahoma and she married my uh, other great grandfather. Samuel Garrett was a, a white man that married a woman, uh, Betsy Captain, I think was her name. And their land was where Garrett Park is. And, which is kind of in the western part of Johnson County. And uh, that's just been recently turned into a park. They actually owned that land up until uh, a few years ago. They made it into, into Garrett Park. <clears throat> and then Richard uh, or Dick Williams was a wagon master who married uh, Joseph Park's niece. And she, uh, she was, um, her name was Margaret Park. And so if you know where Pioneer Crossing Park is, that has this, this really neat uh, monument, that was where their house was. He was a prominent wagon master. He took a lot of wagon trains to Santa Fe. So the uh, tribe originally had 1.6 million acres. And in 1854, again, due to encroachment and uh, uh, settlers wanting the good land in Kansas, the government decided to offer the tribe um, take their land and give them 200,000 acres. And they did that, did that by giving each um, Shawnee citizen uh, 200 acres. So they were allotted 200 acres. And then the balance was basically uh, given up for white settlement. And uh, so the, the acreage that that they were given was just west of the Missouri border. And it was all, again, uh, allotted to tribal members, except for the Black Bob Band. Uh, the Black Bob Band refused to take up individual allotments. They wanted their land in common, and they refused to live as white men like the uh, other Shawnee did, and they wanted to retain their culture and their life. And the treaty allowed them to live, uh, live like that. But then came the Civil War. And so, as you all know, Bleeding Kansas, the, there were a lot of white people living on tribal land, and lots of, and again, lots of brutality, a lot of people getting killed. The whites were, were tearing down and cutting down lumber, and they were just putting up homesteads wherever they wanted to. You had lots of uh, border ruffians and, of course, the Lawrence Massacre. And this is Eliza Silverheel Blue Jacket, who was Moses Silverheel's daughter, my great grandmother's cousin. She was in Lawrence. They lived in Lawrence. And when Quantrell went and raided Lawrence, she had left her home and then said, no, I'm not going to let them do that. So she went back to her home and a, a raider tried climbing in the window and she tomahawked him, hit him in the head, killed him. But it, when she did that, she broke her arm and the tomahawk at the same time. And the tomahawk is still in the family. The Blue Jacket family still has the tomahawk. So the Black Bob Band, who I talked about a minute ago, they live kind of south of Olathe. And during the war, they they left. They said, okay, this is, it was 
they were burning their homes down and killing them. And, and they left, they went out West on the reservation, a little further West. And then after the war, they came back. And by the time they'd gotten back, there were people living in their homes and, and the government wouldn't, wouldn't do anything about it. And then the government and some speculators ended up selling the land, a lot of it, I think, illegally. And block, the Black Bob Band ended up moving down to uh, where the absentee were in, in near Oklahoma City. So I'm done. So after after European contact, the, the Shawnee, as well as a lot of other tribes, were just constantly pressured and displaced by European American encroachment for almost 250 years by the time you include Kansas. And there were times of peace, there was times of war, most of it was fighting, lots of brutal attacks on both sides for control of the land. <clears throat> uh, Shawnee survived the periodic warfare, the death by diseases, and everything that the uh, Europeans did that was uh, detrimental to them. Uh, they destroyed their food stores. They stayed as long as they could. And then eventually they said, okay, we're going west of the Mississippi. But it didn't end there, right? Uh, after 40 years on the reservation in Kansas, they were again encroached on. And and it was best, they felt like it was best to move to Indian Territory because there weren't going to be white people living in in Oklahoma or Indian Territory. So they moved down there. I mean, it's the same same story. Different, it's kind of like Groundhog Day, same story, different verse. And so now there's three federally recognized tribes who prosper today, despite all the past pressure to eliminate them. And uh, we're all still here and viable, and we still have tribal members that live in Kansas City. So uh, that's my presentation. All right. Thank you so much for that. It's very important history and one that we don't know very well around here. So I'm very glad to um, have had you and that was a great presentation. Um, we've run out of time for questions, but you'll have a chance to see Jim again at programs for both Olathe Public Library and Lenexa Historical Society. So watch both of those places for uh, future programs. Thank you to the Johnson County Library staff who helped make this program possible. And thank you all so much for attending our program today. Please let us know uh, through the poll on your screen where you heard about the program so we know where to advertise in the future. So thank you all for attending, and we will see you in June at our next program. Thank you.